All right. Well, um, I was very uh, flattered to be asked to by uh, Riemo to give a talk uh, at this meeting. Um, that's officially, I'm told it's World Logic Day. Well, my talk won't have a great deal to do with logic, although I had been a logician for many years, not so much of a practicing one now, but uh, so my talk is actually going to be on, on mathematics and aesthetics. Um, and it, uh, I'm hoping that uh, you'll find it uh, uh, interesting. It'll cover a fair amount of ground. It's a paper which I'm actually going to read uh, when um, I'm hoping that when this is being recorded, of course, and when the, uh, the my performance, such as it is, will be brought, uh, actually presented at the meeting, I'm hoping that Guillermo will arrange for some pictures uh, to be shown, pictures mainly of paintings and some other things. Um, during the talk, but well, that will all be sorted out later. All right. Well, let me begin um, uh, by two quotations. Uh, two quotations. One for, for two great mathematicians, uh, both of whom were concerned with art. The first by Hermann Weil, in which one of the many memorable uh, quotations in this case is my work has always tried to unite the true with the beautiful. And when I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the beautiful. And also G.H. Hardy, who uh, it is mathematician's apology, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, said, I'm interested in mathematics only as a creative art. Uh, now, of course, the this are, these are maybe not typical views of mathematicians, but a number of mathematicians do regard their work as having some aesthetic value. And uh, that has been uh, the idea that mathematics had aesthetic value and it goes back uh, a very long way. In fact, let me begin by, uh, by saying that for a long time, mathematics was regarded as embodying what you might call uh, intelligible beauty. Um, and indeed, the association of mathematics with the beautiful was first explicitly made by Plato, although presumably that connection had been had made before him. But nevertheless, the sort of, class, the sort of locus classicus of this connection uh, is, is in one of the, the, the Platonic dialogues, uh, the Philebus to be exact, in which Socrates says, I do not mean by beauty of form uh, such beauty as that of animals or pictures, but understand me to mean straight lines and circles. For these I affirm to be not relatively beautiful, like other things, but eternally and absolutely beautiful. So for Plato, the essence of mathematical beauty was its absoluteness, uh, its resistance to change in fashion, of course. That's true, of course, in Plato's case for his idea of the forms in general and, and mathem the mathematical forms, of course, were particular sorts of forms and were not subject to change as uh, was true of all Plato's forms. Now, some four centuries later, after this uh, uh, statement by, by uh, well, by Socrates, actually, the, uh, the historian Plutarch asserts, the purpose of geometry is to draw us away from the sensible and the perishable to the intelligible and eternal. Now, the word intelligible here has two meanings. First, of course, the usual meaning of comprehensible or capable of being understood. But the word also has an older meaning, namely capable of being apprehended only by the intellect, not by the senses. In this guise, it serves as an antonym to sensible. It is, I think, precisely with this signification that Plutarch uses the word intelligible in this quotation. So you might think of mathematics as being a kind of art of the, of the intelligible, 
which is the title of uh, one of my old books, actually. Plutarch doesn't mention beauty here and in this quotation, but he does link sensible with perishable and intelligible with eternal. Now, most of those who discern beauty in mathematics, uh, largely but not exclusively mathematicians, I mean, most people don't see much beauty in mathematics, as, 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 as you know. I mean, well, anyway, they would, I think, believe, uh, I believe, would hold the view that the kind of beauty involved uh, is of the intelligible variety rather than the sensible. Thus, Bertrand Russell said, mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty, a beauty cold and austere like that of sculpture, without appeal to any part of our weaker nature, without the gorgeous trappings of painting or music, yet sublimely pure and capable of a stern perfection such as only the greatest art can show. The true spiritual delight, the exaltation, the sense of being more than man, which is the touchstone of the highest excellence, is to be found in mathematics as surely as poetry. And G. H. Hardy made uh, uh, expressed similar uh, sentiments when he remarked in the, I guess it's in the, I don't have a reference, but I'm pretty sure it's the mathematician's apology. The mathematician's patterns, like the painters or the poets, must be beautiful. The 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 ideas, like uh, the colors or the or the word or the words, must fit together in a harmonious unity. Beauty is the first test. There is no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. You tell that to the applied mathematicians. But Hardy did not, of course, Hardy didn't like applied mathematics very much. He refused to have anything to do with it. Many, I guess, would agree with Plato and Plutarch that the beauty of mathematics is grounded in its eternality, its permanence, that cold, austere beauty, as Russell uh, said. They would hold that mathematical truth, once established, becomes imperishable. Just as Michelangelo's David, once carved from the marble, is held by artists to achieve an imperishability, transcending its origins as an extract from a piece of stone. Even when the statue itself, or even should the statue itself be destroyed or crumble into dust. Hardy expresses this conviction memorably. He says, Archimedes will be remembered even when Aeschylus is forgotten because languages die and mathematical ideas do not. Immortality may be a silly word, but probably a mathematician has the best chance of, achieve, of, of achieving whatever it may mean. The great 20th century French mathematician Claude Chevalier, uh, one of the Bourbaki members, regarded the imperishability and the aesthetic value of mathematics as stemming from its employment of rigorous argument. So we are getting a bit of logic in here. As reported by his daughter, the philosopher Catherine Chevalier, she says, for my father, it was important to see questions as a whole, to see the necessity of a proof, its global implications. As to rigor, all the members of Bourbaki uh, cared about it. The Bourbaki movement was uh, started essentially because rigor was lacker, lacking among French mathematicians by comparison with the Germans, that is the Hilbertians. Rigor consisted in getting rid of an accretion of superfluous details. Conversely, lack of rigor gave my father uh, an impression of a proof where one, was, uh, where one was walking in mud where one had to pick up some sort of filth in order to get, to get ahead. Once that filth was washed away, one could get that the mathematical object, a sort of crystallized body whose essence is its structure. When that in, uh, interested him, something to look at, to admire, perhaps to turn around, but certainly not to transform. <clears throat> Let me repeat that. When that structure had been produced, he would say it is an object which interested him, something to look at, to admire, perhaps to turn around, but certainly not to transform. For him, rigor in mathematics consisted in making a new object which could thereafter remain unchanged. Um, 
<clears throat> that's a very platonic view, of course, or Platonistic view, if you like. The way my father worked, it's, it seems that uh, that what was uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> what was counted most, this production of an object which then became inert, dead, really. It is. It was no longer to be altered or transformed. Not that there was any negative connotation to this, but I must add that my father was probably the only member of Bourbaki who thought of mathematics as a way to put objects to death for aesthetic reasons. Well, this is what uh, Chevalier's daughter thought of what Chevalier was doing. Thus, uh, that's the end of her quotation for her. Uh, thus, one could say, in Chevalier's eyes, mathematical rigor had had an aesthetic purpose, namely to induce a kind of rigor mortis. Of course, the old pun, logical rigor is rigor mortis, in the objects of mathematics, so that their beauty could be per permanently on display, like butterflies mounted in a case. For Chevalier, mathematical rigor seems also to have had a moral significance. This is attested uh, by the final first, uh, final sentence of the preface to his work, Fundamental Concepts of Algebra, some of you may know, which I studied in my youth and has always remained with me. This, this remark that he makes in the preface, or the, at the end of the preface, this, he says, is an exercise in rectitude of thought, of which it would be futile to disguise the authority. Hmm. I remember as an undergraduate being very impressed with this, although I didn't entirely agree with it, but very impressed. But as with artists, not all mathematicians subscribe to the doctrine that the purpose of their activity is to produce works of enduring unchangeability. One of the most important dissenters among mathematicians was Brouwer, the founder of the Mathematical School of Intuitionism, who once uh, remarked, that he had changed his view of mathematics as a collection of truths fascinating by their, uh, by their immovability, but horrifying by their lifelessness, like stones from barren mountains of disconsolate infinity, to a concern with that which is, he quote, built out of our own thinking. In his, uh, well, it's a, it's a paper of 1948, Consciousness, Philosophy and Mathematics, Brower offers the following observations on beauty in general and in math mathematics in particular. He says, in causal thinking and acting, beauty will hardly be found. Things as such, no, shouldn't do that. Things as such are, are, things as such are, not, be are not beautiful, nor is their domination by shrewdness. Therefore, satisfaction in, a, in efficacy of causal acts of systems of actual, uh, 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 or discoveries of new causal sequences is no sensation of beauty. But in the first phase of the exodus of consciousness from its deepest home, this is typical of our course, there is beauty in the, in the uh, joyful miracle of, of the, of the self-revelation of consciousness. An apparent, uh, <coughs> sorry, as apparent in egoic elements of the object found in form and forces of nature, in particular in human figures, and human destinies, human splendor, and human misery. You wouldn't think a mathematician was writing there, but that's about art. I shall, I shall go on. I shall skip some of this because it's a long quotation. But the full, he concludes here with, but the fullest constructional beauty is the introspective beauty of mathematics, where instead of elements of playful, causal acting. The basic intuition of mathematics is left to free unfolding. Uh, of course, all this idea of free unfolding and so on is, is uh, underlies his whole conception of the continuum, for example, which of course was his primary concern uh, as a mathematician. Well, there's an, when he became an intuitionist mathematician. Uh, anyway, he goes on, this unfolding is not bound to the exterior world. Uh, and uh, thereby to uh, fruitfulness and responsibility. Consequently, its introspective harmonies can, uh, can attain any degree of richness and clearness. Brower shared, one might say, with the Romantics, the conviction that beauty and truth 
are inexorably connected with life and consciousness. Now, I'd like to go on to talk a bit about mathematic, uh, the, 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 an automatic uh, uh, connection between mathematics and aesthetics or beauty is, is through music, of course. And I will like to say a few words about that. Mathematics has often been compared with music. For example, in a letter to Christian Goldbach of, of the Goldbach Conjecture of 1712, Leibniz remarks, music is a hidden arith arithmetic exercise of the soul, which does not know that it is counting. So for Leibniz, mathematics, uh, uh, I'm sorry, music was really unconscious counting. If you want to sum it up. Leibniz, ever the intellectual, actually went further in claiming that not only music, but the sensible in general is reducible to the intelligible. Uh, maybe not always directly to mathematics, but certainly into uh, a kind of at least a kind of philosophical understanding. And he says, even the pleasures of sense are reducible to intellectual pleasures. Uh, I, have done, I finally did that are reducible to intellectual pressures, uh, known in a confused way. Music charms us, although its beauty consists in only in the agreement of numbers and in the counting, which we do not uh, uh, perceive, but which the, so the soul nevertheless continues to carry out. <coughs> Excuse me. Of the beats or vibrations of something, bodies which coincide at certain intervals. The pleasures which the eye finds in proportions are of the same nature. And those caused by other senses amount to something similar, although we may not be able to explain them so distinctly. This is Leibniz from 1714. For a long time, Western scholars um, classified music or its theoretical basis at least as a branch of mathematics. This originated with the Pythagoreans who are said to have coined the term mathematics from a root meaning learning or knowledge. The remarkable advances in mathematics made by the Pythagoreans led them to the belief that mathematics and more especially number lies at the heart of all existence. The first, what you might call mathematical philosophy. For the Pythagoreans, the structure of mathematics took the form of a bifurcating scheme of oppositions. And there's a picture here. Uh, which I can actually put on here and maybe you can, it can be seen. Oh, unfortunately it's, it's reversed, but never mind. Anyway, it starts off with mathematics at the top and then by bifurcation, that's split into the discrete and the continuous, which is a basic opposition, of course, in, in Greek mathematics. And then each of these in turn is split in the absolute, the relative, that's for the discrete, the static, and the moving for the continuous. And then, right, each of these corresponds to the four, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the four elements of what was called the quadrivium, which was the basis for Western education up until the Middle Ages, namely arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. These were the four branches, traditional four branches of mathematics. Of course, uh, uh, astronomy, uh, the only, the only th that are left now in, in, uh, uh, under this, in this scheme under, under mathematics is arithmetic and geometry. Music moved off a long time ago and astronomy of course became part of physics, but nevertheless, uh, these were the traditional divisions of mathematics. The Pythagoreans seem to have been concerned solely with the mathematical, that is intelligible aspects of music. But of course, as actually heard or even imagined, music has aesthetic qualities, <clears throat> which are entirely sensible in the sense of which we've been using the term. Thus Keats, for example, his famous quotation, heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Music pleases or moves us. It has an emotional content. Leibniz acknowledges this when he observes, we do not always choose, uh, sorry, we do not always observe wherein the perfection of pleasing things consists or what kind of perfection within ourselves they serve, yet our feelings perceive it, even though our understanding does not. We commonly say, there is something, I know not what, that pleases me in the matter. This we call sympathy. But those who seek the causes of things will usually find 
<coughs> excuse me, that there is something at the bottom of the matter, which, although unnoticed, really appeals to us. Music is a beautiful, beautiful example of this. Everything that emits a sound contains a variation, uh, um, <coughs> sorry, a vibration or a transverse motion, such as we see in, in strings. Thus, everything that emits sounds gives off sensible, uh, invisible impulses. When these are not confused, but proceed together in order, but with a certain uh, variation, they are pleasing. In the same way, we also notice certain changes from long to short syllables and a coincidence of rhymes in poetry, which, which have contained a silent music, as it were, and when correctly constructed, are pleasant even without being sung. And he continues in the matter. One might be tempted using uh, from Leibniz's characterization to characterize music as audible mathematics inducing pure emotion. The sensible and intelligible qualities of music not only uh, coexist, but can be experienced simultaneously. The pleasure of listening to a Bach fugue, for example, has both sensible and intelligible elements. In addition to responding to the purely sensible beauty of the music, an acquaintance with fugal form enables one to derive intellectual pleasure from hearing the structured, uh, <coughs> excuse me, entries of the subject, the counter subject, the stredo, et cetera, et cetera. In a sense, the simultaneous presentation of the sensible and intelligible aspects of music provides the basis for the, of the Pythagorean account of music as a branch of mathematics. And uh, the, uh, yes, okay, I think I'll continue just with this. For instance, consider their discovery, that the, uh, the Pythagorean's discovery, that the euphony of the perfect fifth is associated with a simple arithmetical ratio three to two. Both are beautiful, the former to the senses, the latter, if in an elementary way, the ratio three to two to the intellect. The sensory quality is directly revealed to the senses, not the intellect while the mathematical quality is directly grasped by the intellect and not the senses. Yet, after the Pythagorean revelation, both become graspable by the intellect simultaneously. Of course, the two may evoke one, uh, one another in a, uh, as a mere linkage. It's perfectly possible for one to hear in one's inner ear a perfect fifth chord when contemplating the ratio three to two. In my case, just to give a... <laughs> uh, a, maybe a strange example. Such a leakage arises when, with opus numbers. For instance, the number 59 quickly evokes in, the, in me the beginning of Beethoven's first Razumovsky quartet, and 511, the first few bars of Mo, Mozart's A minor rondo. Well, I'm not the only mathematician who likes that sort of thing. Now, the equal temperament scale, famously used by Bach in composing his 48 Peleus and Fugues, provides a major link between mathematics and music. Here are the intervals between the notes of the 12 pitch chromatic scale are made uniform by specifying that the pitch ratio of each note to its predecessor is exactly the, tw the 12th root of two. The result is a scale completely symmetric in ascent and descent uh, so that one can start with any pattern of notes whatsoever and transpose or invert it at will without harmonic distortion. In the last century, the great Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg, in creating the, his dodecaphonic or serial method of composition, took full advantage of the musical possibilities offered by mathematical operations on note patterns. In Schoenberg's approach, the notes of the chromatic scale are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, are initially arranged in a fixed order called a series. In the development of the composition, the series may be manipulated in a variety of ways, for example, transposed or inverted or reversed. The series provides thus the germ from which the whole work grows. Schoenberg's journey to serialism had begun some time earlier with his abandonment of traditional tonal composition and his revolutionary declaration of the emancipation of the dissonance. But soon his revolutionary fervor gave way to the uncomfortable realization that in abandoning tonality, he had, he had opened the door 
to musical anarchy. In Schoenberg's eyes, the anarchy unleashed by serialism, sorry, by totalism, by atotalism, had nothing directly to do with the loss of the euphony of diatonic composition. <laughs> it, uh, it entails the loss, one might say, of sensible beauty. After all, there was nothing preventing an atonal composer from observing occasional uh, adherence to the tonal compositional practice. In, indeed, the majority of atonal composers did exactly that. As Schoenberg is supposed to have said, there is still plenty of good music to be written in, in the key of C major. What seems to concern Schoenberg was the loss in the transition to atonality of the organizational principles governing tonal composition, major, minor, triad, sonotiform, and, and so forth. In other words, he lamented the loss, not of sensible beauty, but of intelligible beauty. Accordingly, he sought new organizing principles for musical composition. Once again, as with the Pythagoreans based on mathematics. But this time, <clears throat> excuse me, the Western compositional system, itself the result of piecemeal historical additions to the original Pythagorean insight that euphony as perceived by the human ear is built on simple arithmetic relations. This was to be replaced by an organized structure built from a single universal musico-mathematical uh, entity, the equal temperament scale. In other words, you might think of it as a new foundation for music, just as movement in mathematics have I'd introduce new foundations from fairly simple initial principles. Uh, I'll just remark on this, if it's, if I think, of, of interest. Another revival of the Pythagorean, real, the Pythagorean link between mathematics and music has appeared with the rise of so-called musical set theory. I don't know how many of the audience know about that. Musical set theory. Here, musical compositions are analyzed by treating them as sets sequences and permutations of pitches or pitch classes, <coughs> equivalence classes under octaves. It's all really very mathematical. In, equal, in, in, equal, in the equal temperament scale, uh, equal temperament tuning subject to musical operations such as transposition, inversion, and complementation. And of course, these all form, all of these operations form groups under, under composition. There is another one, the, these, these musical set, theor set theorists are, I, they're composers who are actually quite have some real consciousness uh, and some knowledge of mathematics, since they, they also do study some group theory as well as set theory. Musical set theory arises naturally as a mathematical analysis of the serial method of composition. More recently, mathematical music theory has been developed in an attempt to extend the original Pythagorean analysis uh, of Euphony. <coughs> Here, category theory and topos theory have been pressed into service to explicate the use of the diatonic scale and the consonants dissonance opposition. I mean, I was quite struck uh, when I uh, first started to learn topos theory some years ago now that there was, I came across a book called The Topos of Music. And, uh, some musical mathematician had actually written a whole account of, <laughs> of musical analysis based on, on, on topos theory. Now, of course, probably uh, uh, maybe an equally important connection uh, between mathematics and aesthetics or mathematics and art and generally is, is uh, and, and even perhaps even more, uh, well, a more recent connection in any rate, uh, and maybe one that is um, perhaps more familiar uh, to the general public. Uh, is the connection through uh, painting and the development of perspective in the, during, really in Italy during the Renaissance. There are numerous links between mathematics and the visual arts. The most important of these arose in the emergence of projective geometry from the study of perspective by visual artists. Uh, this is a rare example of a mathematical discipline whose origins lie entirely in art. Um, I really can't, it's difficult to think of another one. Um, it's true that you see in the case in the case of the Pythagoreans, they had already they they really applied mathematics uh, directly to musical analysis, 
Projective geometry, on the other hand, didn't exist right, before the painter, which had the Renaissance painters, thought about, uh, introduced the idea of perspective. Projective geometry issued from the development in the 15th and 16th centuries of, of a radically new approach to perspective drawing. The central problem of perspective drawing, that is the portrayal of three dimensions on two dimensional surface, which was the basic problem, had been studied by artists since the stone age. It's true that the problem of presenting these images uh, on paper, it's true that the idea of perspective was always implicitly present in these, you know, in, in the whole endeavor uh, to present three dimensional, uh, three -dimensional uh, scenes on, on, you know, on two dimensional uh, surfaces. Uh, but uh, anyway, there are various examples of this, uh, the, uh, which go back a long time, which I, I, will, uh, I will actually skip here because I don't know how long am I been now, three quarters of an hour, so okay. Well, let me go on then uh, to the case of the development of perspective uh, drawing in the modern sense, or in the, in the sense of, of uh, uh, well, you might call it the early modern sense. In Europe, it wasn't until the first half of the 15th century that Italian painters, through the introduction of the horizon line and vanishing point, of course, which both became later in terms of projective geometry, transformed projective drawing, sorry, perspective drawing into an exact science. The fundamental principles were worked out by the architect uh, Brunelleschi. Uh, and the artist and mathematician Piero della Francesca, both of whom, of course, are well known. Brunelleschi are very well known as an architect, and of course, Piero della Francesca is a painter. Um, in fact, in Brunelleschi's case, he became so interested in the geometry of the thing, he sort of came up designing buildings and was an early contributor to the development of the, of the, of the mathematics of projective geometry. Uh, well, let me give you an example. The formulation of the laws of perspective revolutionized painting in Renaissance Italy, and the technique of perspective became an essential constituent in the works of later masters. And they're all very familiar, of course. Uh, in his great ball painting, The Last Supper of Leonardo, it's one of the most famous paintings, should be an illustration here, for example. Leonardo da Vinci employs perspective in a subtle way to draw the viewer's eyes to the composition center. Another important, uh, uh, as we all know, or should know, that Leonardo himself was very interested in mathematics. Most of these painters were um, as a, well, uh, not only for the artistic uh, applications you select, but also as a, as a kind of uh, uh, branch of pure mathematics. Durer, for example, uh, Albert Durer, the German painter and, uh, 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 artist would cut man uh, drawing a loop. Actually, this picture should be shown here. It's not here, but should be. Actually, depicts two figures engaged in applying the theory of perspective. You know, the idea of projecting of uh, projective planes, right? Of uh, projecting a, a figure one plane to uh, another plane uh, inclined towards it. Of course, this is the basis of idea conic sections. So I will get the, more of the description here. Now, the origins of projective geometry lie in the study of perspective. A painter's picture uh, or photograph can be regarded as a projection of the depicted scene onto the canvas or photographic film. <laughs> With the painter's eye or, uh, or the focal point of the camera's lens acting as a center of projection. And, Projective geometry arose not from use of cameras as a later development, but really from the idea of trying to systematize or, or, or really to make more realistic uh, the, the actual image that, uh, that the eye has when it actually is functioning in the normal way. And the eye sees things in perspective, the brain does see objects in perspective. Uh, it's remarkable that that really could be, if you think, uh, it's a projective geometry then becomes a kind of, if you like, a, an intellectual or a, a part of mathematics 
but really it's it's an attempt to render intelligible something that's sensible right in its origins namely the actual images that come to the senses in this case of the visual the perspective that we actually see when we look into the world so projective geometry that is the mathematical study of perspective properties <clears throat> The projective property, the, the projective properties being the ones that are preserved, right, under projections. So projective geometry is the mathematics of perspective and, and, and their use of perspective. Artists may be said to be presenting mathematics in a visual, in a visual form. Now, early in the 20th century, of course, the, what happened again, uh, both the laws of perspective were established and you could do, painters then became really extreme realists. Uh, if you'd like to look at, uh, for the next 300 years, I suppose, the uh, uh, painting was extremely realistic. And it wasn't until the 19th century that that got shaken up, initially by the Impressionists and then by the Cubists and then later by the abstract artists and so on. So early in the 20th century, certain artists began to abandon what by this time had become the traditional technique of perspective. These artists that were led by the Cubist painters, Brock and Picasso. It, well, of course, I, I, I should remark that really the, 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 there's an earlier move, the Impressionists. Uh, it's interesting that in the case of the Impressionists, though, uh, Renoir and so forth, there wasn't, this was really an attempt to return directly to, if you like, the, uh, to subjectivity in, in, a, in a kind of internal sense. Just impressions, injecting mood, for example, into the painting. The Cubist artists, on the other hand, uh, were really interested in changing, changing the geometric presentation of the painting. Uh, both Bach and Picasso, as it happens, were interested in mathematics. Uh, in particular, we know that Picasso actually had read some of the popular works of Poincaré, the great French mathematician of the day. And they were actually quite interested in the idea of actually modifying the way in which, the, the, if you like, the mathematical way in which the, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in way uh, in which pr perspective is actually presented through the traditional method. So they introduced a new technique, which instead of attempting to produce the impression of three dimensions, brought the bi-dimensionality of the canvas into the foreground. To achieve this, they decomposed objects into elementary geometric forms such as planes, cubes, and pyramids, which were then reassembled and presented in a, in a sorry, relief-like way on a flat or hollow space. Uh, well, this is very much like combinatorial topology, which arose about the same time. Uh, Luis Poincaré uh, was one of the pioneers in this. And it's, it, it's interesting that there is a, a sort of connection between the, you know, the, the two developments. Uh, Anyway, I will, okay, well, let me just say, these, this technique uh, dominates Picasso's er, er, early Cubist paintings. And uh, in, in Bach in 1980 introduced geometric cubism. Oops, sorry. <laughs> geometric cubism, in which natural objects such as trees and mountains were presented as shaded cubes and pyramids. <clears throat> The contemporary art critic Louis Vorcel was piqued to describe these bizarrerie cubique, which apparently gave the movement cubism its name, bizarre cubes. A number of contemporary critics thought that in abandoning perspective, the cubist painters were taking a step backwards. Right? It's, it's, it's interesting that you, there's a, some kind of sophisticated. It, in a way, it's more sophisticated than what was going on before. In other ways, it's more it's, it's simpler. Certainly, Vossel thought so, referring to the members of the Cubist movement as ignorant geometers, reducing the human body, the sight, to pallid cubes. From a mathematical standpoint, however, the Cubists were actually making what has to be regarded as an advance. For their technique of decomposing objects into elementary geometric forms, is closely analogous to the central idea of combinatorial topology. A branch of mathematics which was emerging at about the same time, led by the great French mathematician Henri Poincaré. Here the central idea 
is the investigation of the properties of topological spaces by subjecting them to combinatorial decomposition into simpler spaces such as simplicial complexes, of course, which is the basis of algebraic topology or combinatorial topology, uh, constructed by gl uh, gluing together points, line segments, triangles, and their higher dimensional counterparts. The planes, cubes, and pyramids of the cubist artists correspond to the simplicial complexes of the mathematicians. It should be mentioned that Picasso, among, among, uh, along with a number of his fellow cubists, had read Poincaré's Science and Hypothesis a famous popular book of uh, Poincaré's and had been deeply impressed by Poincaré's claim that Euclidean geometry as applied to space was essentially a convention rather than an absolute truth. And that other non-Euclidean geometries might be equally acceptable as descriptions of the structure of space. Anyway, mathematics has exerted some influence on a number of, of, of subsequent artists, which I will, uh, uh, I will skip here because it's a, it's a, a one of the well. I'll just mention one of them. Um, the uh, the the you may know the well. It, it had the the um, uh, mathematical ideas that influenced quite a few of these uh, later on. For particularly, uh, for example, Salvador Dali, the famous surrealist, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, and. Um, Maurice Escher, who did these impossible uh, objects and so forth. Now, let me come to um, some other examples. Uh, the, I should just mention briefly the idea that moving to uh, away from geometry really, uh, 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 really more to what we might call well, closely, more closely connected to logic, namely cognitive paradoxes. Uh, if we, uh, I, I, those of you may be familiar with the surrealist painter, Oné Magritte, and in his paintings, I'm hoping there'll be some images here. Uh, his, in his paintings, which are uh, very, they, they look real, He's much in, but they're images of paradoxical things that actually look like, like uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, cognitive paradoxes. For example, in his painting, La Condition Humaine of 1933, Magritte presents an easel on which a painting sits smoothly blending into a view through a window, which is framed by actual curtains in the painting. His 1942 work, The Domain of Arnhem, depicts a shattered window whose shards lying on the floor still show the outside world they originally concealed. And then, of course, there are the famous paintings of more, uh, or if you like really uh, drawings mainly of, um, uh, of Moritz Escher, who famously has, a, should be a, uh, an illustration of this, these impossible staircases that look as if they're going upward, but really are impossible. They can't be, they, they can be presented in two dimensional space as if they were pre presentations of actual three dimensional objects projected onto a two-dimensional image, but there is no corresponding three-dimensional object. This is, of course, a very mathematical idea. And we know also, of course, that um, a matter of, it's of interest to note that Escher and uh, Roger Penrose, the great uh, mathematical physicist and mathematician, uh, who was very interested and actually came from a family of artists, uh, was very interested in these, in these sort of, uh, in, in these cognitive paradoxes presented by uh, artistically, and of course, uh, there's a famous image of, 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 um, uh, of Roger Penrose, which is this impossible triangle, again, that looks like a triangle, a, a, a solid triangle, right, presented in a play, but there is no solid triangle in three dimensions possible. However, what looks like his projection, he, he produced, now, uh, this was done, apparently that that work of Penrose has had quite an influence on, on Escher himself, and they continued their uh, correspondence for quite a long time. Okay. Um, now, one another a, a very important place where mathematics uh, plays a role in art, of course, uh, and indeed is, is very much a mathematical uh, importance in physics and, of course, in mathematics, is the idea of symmetry. In everyday discourse, 
the word is associated with a sense of harmonious proportion and balance. The idea of a whole composed of parts fitting together in an aesthetically pleasing way. As, as Blaise Pascal, great 17th century mathematician and of course religious mystic observes in his pensee, symmetry is what we see at a glance. It immediately springs to the eye. And Leibniz again, the pleasure of sense, which most closely, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> which most closely uh, approach pleasures of the mind and are the most pure and the most certain are, those, are that of music and that of symmetry. The former uh, being pleasure of the ears, the latter of the eyes. So Leibniz symmetry is really a kind of idealized, a very pure sort of pleasure that's produced visually. Uh, then there's a famous poem, which is, which is, uh, I, I, which I, I find it, this is quoted by Hermann Weil, of course, who's very sensitive to literature, in his great work, the preface to his great work, Symmetry, one of his uh, later uh, writings. This is by poet Anna Wickham. God, thy great, thou great symmetry, who put a biting lust in me from whence my sorrows spring. For all the fritter days that I have spent in shapeless ways, give me one perfect thing. That is where it was in Viles uh, preface that I first read this poem. I'd not heard of Anna Wickham before, but of course Viles Viol had a kind of immense range in uh, not only mathematics, but also in aesthetics, philosophy, and pretty well everything else. Now, in mathematics, the term symmetry has a more precise definition involving the concept of invariance under a transformation or transformations. And we know that idea of invariance has become paramount, really, in, in, in modern mathematics and physics. Uh, and of course, there's so many familiar examples of this, I don't I have time to give them all. Uh, another important example uh, place where, where symmetry occurs is now finally coming to, uh, well, to the written word, to literature, uh, is poetic meter. I mean, poetic meter, of course, in poetry corresponds to meter uh, or rhythmic patterns, if you like, uh, in, uh, in music. And of course, there are many different types of meter, iambic, archaic, excuse me, anapaestic and so forth. And of course, it has been a long study, but, but of course the writing of poetry, it was again, uh, poetry up to the end of the 19th century was mainly written in using these symmetric forms, but the corresponding, uh, what happened in the case of painting and later on in music was that they, these, these symmetric patterns were essentially abandoned. Of course, it's also true that always been uh, poetry that in which the symmetry wasn't as regular. Uh, for example, where rhyming wasn't used, what's so-called blank verse. Uh, but the, it's interesting all about the same time, maybe towards the end of the 19th century, the end of the 19th, early 20th century. You might say that the kind of uh, symmetry that was exhibited in the arts uh, was actually abandoned or modified very drastically and a, a, a new kind of freedom in, then right by abandoning that symmetry. Then the symmetry, of course, later on was reestablished. Uh, in the case of mathematics, it's very interesting that when you ask, uh, that I've always thought, for example, that when it's easy to see the idea of revolutions, real changes, uh, where even where previous art is, is thrown out. In the case of revolutions in art, even when sometimes the old art or the old uh, techniques are brought back. Uh, in the case of, uh, and also in the case of, of physics, after all, there was uh, the idea of phlogiston, for example, or the earlier, thing, or, or indeed Aristotle's uh, theory of gravity, <laughs> if you like. Well, it was thrown out and it hasn't been brought back. And it becomes, as Stanislaw Lem would put it, sort of fantastic literature. Uh, that's not true in mathematics. Really, I don't think mathematics has thrown any, any of its previous uh, work out at all. Well, there have been arguments about this, and I didn't want to go to the issue of whether there are revolutions, real genuine revolutions in mathematics. But nevertheless, you can see that 
this is a good illustration of, of the fact that what happened, there were revolutions going on in mathematics, but they didn't throw out the previous. There's one example, to be fair, the infinitesimals were more or less thrown out for a time, but they're back. Okay. Well, I read a bunch of poems, which I uh, will skip. Again, I, the, the idea of symmetry arises in, in, in music quite frequently. Uh, and we find that, for example, in the, uh, it, it, this goes back quite a long way to, to medieval music, uh, where one has the idea of a fugue or canon or the inversion of a, of a, uh, of a theme, all of which really is an example of symmetry and all of which for which there's all a, uh, a corresponding group, right? Of, the, of, uh, of invariance under, uh, under, under those symmetries. So there are many examples of that. Uh, another example I'm particularly fond of uh, in, in, in literature is the, is, is the notion of a palindrome a sentence that runs backwards and forwards, <clears throat> that it really is its mirror image, I mean, up to certain conventions like spacing and so forth. Uh, so for example, the probably the most famous one of these, uh, at least one of the earliest that, that recorded in English, at any rate, Romans and Greeks both had them, palindromes, was uh, the one describing uh, Napoleon's predicament, Abel was I, or I saw Elba when he was uh, banished to Elba. And others like a man, a plan, a canal, Panama, and so forth. It's interesting that in the case of a man, a plan, a canal, Panama, computers, well, as we're expecting AI to take over everything, but they, as with chess, and being, they've also taken over palindromes too. So what was originally a brilliant palindromic phrase uh, I forget who actually uh, produced it now. J.A. Linden, I think. A man, a plan, a canal, Panama. It's not a sentence, it's a phrase. They're referring to Theodore Roosevelt indirectly. Is now somebody found they could stick a cat or a canal. For example, a man, a plan, a cat, a canal, Panama. A man, a plan, a can, <laughs> sorry. Uh, a yak, a yam, a canal, Panama and so on. Uh, a 540 word version of this palindrome has now been generated by computers. Uh, again, that's maybe taking the fun out of it. So it turns out, I, I guess as a historical note, it should come as no surprise that the construction of palindromes, word palindromes, right, appeals to those of a mathematical turn of mind. The topologist Peter Hilton, who worked, who worked with Alan Turing on the Enigma project during the Second World War, came up presumably for relief from the rigors of his official duties with a remarkably, a remarkable palindrome, Doc Note, I Descent. A fast never presents a fatness, I diet on cod. Uh, one of the famous one, the, the uh, short palindromes of duty and probably when he was taking time off from, from the Enigma project, <clears throat> was sex at noon taxes, really. A haunting example of a poem, the, uh, the uh, each line of which is palindromic, is Lee Mercer's, sounds like a surrealist poem, could have been written by a surrealist poet, Four Palindromes of the Apocalypse. An era missed its, dim, missed its <clears throat> dim arena, elapses pale, no in an even union, liars the last rail. Anyway, the surprisingly, perhaps much less common are word unit palindromes. Uh, I mean, you, you might think it's easy; would be easier to construct the word unit in which the word is the unit, not the letter. It's not true. Uh, there are not very many. Um, a famous one is the motto of the Three Musketeers, as I'm sure many of you read: "All for one, and one for all." There is a unit; is a word unit. Uh, palindromic phrase. J. A. Linden constructed a number of nice examples, such as bomb disposal squad with failed technique, failed with <coughs> with squad disposal bomb. Uh, 
uh, one that I invented uh, in, in connection with mathematics, uh, really the same kind of structure as uh, Linden's is, you could circle the square, can't you? But you can't square the circle, can you? Uh, the students didn't get this at first, but I had to. Got a couple of, of giggles later on. Now, let me conclude with um, uh, some the idea of formal beauty in mathematics. Inasmuch as beauty in mathematics does not appeal directly to the senses, it's often claimed to possess a formal character. Um, this is witnessed by the common use of math by mathematicians of the term elegant, as in an elegant proof or an elegant solution. Uh, elegance is a, really a formal term. One isn't very moved by it, but one admires it. It's worth uh, dwelling on the meaning of the term formalism, which of course is had a certain vogue in mathematics in the 20th century, being officially Hilbert's philosophy in mathematics, although it wasn't really, but never, never mind, I'm going to that now. In art, the term has been associated with the doctrine that each work of art contains within itself all the elements necessary for understanding and responding to it. An individual work of art is, so to speak, sui generis. On this reckoning, to appreciate or respond to a work of art, one need know nothing of the social or historical con context in which the work was created, at least consciously. One notes that in both visual art and music, the term formalism has often been employed with pejorative intent, as indicating that some that content has been sacrificed in favor of empty form. In mathematics, the term has been employed, for example, by Brouwer with similar pejorative uh, intent. He actually called Russell the logicist, formalists. This is, uh, it was early right, that, that was the way he used the term. Mathematics certainly tends towards formalism in the received sense, in its received sense, since it appears to have a, a synchronic or, as opposed to a diachronic character, given the appropriate cognitive apparatus, Understanding mathematical propositions and proofs depends, like the understanding of language, or better, in the case of mathematics, the assembling of, assembling of jigsaws, only on grasping how the constituents fit together in the here and now. Um, the synchronic character of mathematics is a, is a natural source of the objectivity with such mathematics, uh, with which mathematics is usually credited. Take, for example, the question of whether there is an odd perfect number. Not a burning mathematical issue, but still unresolved. Un uh, <clears throat> unfinished mathematical business, so to speak. The problem, can an odd number be the sum of its divisors? Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Can an odd number be the sum of its divisors? Was known to the Pythagoreans in fi around 550 BC or so we're led to believe. They invented the, apparently the term perfect number. They classified. They, they introduced really the first systematic classification of the problems and numbers. 2,500 years later, the synchronic character of the problem is attested to by the confidence with which it is usually claimed that it has as a mathematical question exactly the same meaning today as it did 2,500 years ago. Now, not every historian of mathematics subscribes to that view, but I think most mathematicians on the whole would take that attitude. Thus, the synchronicity of mathematics, its graspability by its adepts, independently of its historical origins, is transformed into, ob into objectivity, or at least the stability over time. An unsolved mathematical problem like the existence of odd perfect numbers can be likened to a lock constructed by a skilled locksmith who has failed to provide a key for opening it. Once such a lock has been constructed, it becomes an objective matter as to whether a particular key opens it, and also whether such a key can actually be fashioned. Analogously, once a mathematical proposition has been formulated, it becomes an objective matter as to whether a proposed proof is actually a proof. This could be a weighty issue. Witness Andrew Weil's titanic effort to produce a convincing proof of Fermat's last theorem. Mathematicians also see a, a, a formal beauty in mathematical symbolism. Um, many mathematicians do. Um, and of course, there's been an argument that Broward, the intuitionist 
thought that mathematics was a languageless activity. It really didn't need symbols in principle. Uh, personally, I don't agree with that at all. And I'm sure that it's very likely someone like a mathematician such as Chevalier wouldn't agree. Um, but anyway, mathematicians on the whole are very pleased. They're proud of the symbolism that's used. And you know, there are a number of what called beautiful formulas, of course, uh, Euler is e to the i pi equals minus one. <clears throat> it's probably the best known of these, and it is true. It's a very beautiful formula. Actually, it's rather beautifully written down. On the other hand, understanding what it means, what it actually means, is quite difficult. Uh, as as uh, you know, high school teachers have attested. Oh well, what is what does e to the i pi equal minus one really mean? Well, quite difficult to tell. Now, mathematicians also regard mathematics as timeless. They're pleased to think that in practicing, there are, they are exploring or creating a perfect timeless realm who's wholly free of the flaws and uncertainties um, uh, besetting the empirical world. Again, Hardy was, the, this is called Platonism, of course. Uh, Hardy was the great champion of this. He said, I believe that mathematical beauty, uh, uh, re, sorry, mathem mathematical reality uh, lies out, uh, in, outside us, that our function is to discover or to observe it, and that the theorems which we prove and which we describe grandiloquently as our creations are simply the notes of our observations. Mathematicians are, well, to go, uh, that was, uh, this was his observation. Mathematicians are moved almost, but not quite, to the point of tears, to, hope to behold the crystalline realm of mathematics in which beauty is so closely allied to truth. Indeed, the first half of Keats' dicta, beauty is truth, truth beauty, is held by most mathematicians to be realized in the mathematical realm. Note, however, the second half, since there are plenty of mathematical assertions which, while undeniably true, can hardly be described as beautiful. Despite the aesthetic Hardy, uh, Hardy's assertion quoted earlier, well, this is true to some of a lot of the stuff that's generated by computer. Uh, there's a whole load of just stuff which is may turn out actually be uh, to be important, but which isn't isn't particularly attractive. This uh, fact points out one essential difference between the world of mathematics and the world of art or music. Close as the two are in many respects, the artist or musician has a high degree of control over the world he or she creates through the production of, of, of art or musical works. The artist can choose to create works of art that are surpassingly beautiful or shockingly ugly, especially, it must be said, in contemporary art. I mean, <laughs> there's some really ugly stuff out there, although it can, it can be very impressive. <clears throat> Artists have been liberated from the constraints of the beautiful, not so for mathematicians. The mathematician has no such freedom, at least, except in the production of expository works. For in the end, he or she is constrained by the dictates of mathematical truth and proof. Recall the physicist Eddington's observation. Proof is the idol <coughs> before, before whom the pure mathematician tortures himself. This was the view of a physicist. The artist can actually set out to produce a beautiful painting or the composer a beautiful piece of music according to their lights, at least. The mathematician, subject to he or she is, to the twin imperatives of, I, of the idol's truth and proof, tends to be surprised when something of genuine beauty emerges from their efforts. Again, Varro would probably have dissented from this view, since he saw mathematics rather than the way that artists see, it, uh, see art, namely as a free creative activity grounded in, or at least guided by intuition, rather than a struggle to attain some absolute standard of truth or indeed beauty. Now the beauty of a mathematical concept often rests on the contrast between the simplicity and elegance of the concept itself and the richness and variety of the mathematical structures embodying it. That kind of mathematical beauty we might call conceptual beauty in which variety emerges from simplicity was elegantly encapsulated by Poincaré in his characterization of mathematics as the art of calling different things by the same name. In that case, one might ask, parenthetically, is it poetry the art of calling the same thing by different names? 
the conceptual beauty of mathematics in this sense, just uh, the sense in this sense just identified, is analogous to the form of beauty found in musical works such as fugues and canons and so forth. What are some examples of? Uh, I'll just give you a few that I personally uh, I find very uh, embody mathematics uh, embody real conceptual beauty. I think abstract algebra does. The algebraic concept of group ring field monoid vector space module lattice are simple and elegant, and instances are encountered everywhere in mathematics. I think conceptual beauty in mathematics, in the sense in which I have identified, has achieved its fullest expression so far, at least in contemporary mathematics, uh, in, uh, in actually in category theory, resting on the underlying ideas of object transformations of space and notions category functor and so on, have a compelling simplicity and at the same time a vast generality, which has enabled mathematicians to delineate the architecture of mathematics on a grand scale. So there's a little plug for category theory. Anyway, the, the, a related type of conceptual beauty behind the mathematics is of course, which every mathematician will agree on, I think, is, is, is manifested by axiom systems, the idea which goes back to the ancient Greeks where a handful of simple postulates give rise to an extraordinary wealth of consequences. The classical example, of course, is Euclidean geometry. Uh, I mean, it, it's still very remarkable. In Euclid's elements, it's not used much more in school teaching, but if you look at the number, 465 geometric propositions are derived from five simple postulates concerning points, lines, and circles. Of course, it's true that it's not entirely rigorous. I mean, Hilbert, fixed all that up, you know, in his uh, good log of their geometry at the end of the 19th century. Uh, so, all right, well, let me, I'm gonna skip this. I did want to say, finish up, this was some remark on mathematics and fiction. There's a, a movement called fictionalism, as you may or may not know, in philosophy of mathematics, which I'd like to, talk about very briefly. Um, despite Brower's claim that mathematics is languageless, is a languageless activity, this is what he says, it becomes evident, or it seems evident that mathematics is language-based, both in, as, as a formal symbolic practice and in its modes of transmission through textbooks, lectures, etc. It has been observed that mathematics resembles literary fiction, in its systematic introduction of concepts such as numbers, circles, sets, etc., which while lacking concrete existence, I mean, unless you're some kind of extreme Platonist, are then, re uh, are then reified, that is treated as if they really existed. This is as true of constructive as in classical mathematics, by the way. In fiction, characters and events are treated in accordance with Coleridge's willing suspension of dis disbelief, as he describes, this is how we describe one reads a story, you have to suspend your, your knowledge of the fact these events haven't actually occurred. So you would disbelieve them, you suspend this, uh, this disbelief in order to enjoy the story. And you're treating it really when, as if they were, uh, when these objects, mathematical objects, as if they were real. Now, one important difference between classical mathematics, uh, sorry, and the practice of fiction is that the reified concepts of the former, but not the latter, are treated as if their properties were fully determinate. At least there was a general argument going on about whether every, every mathematical problem is actually decidable. This is what it boils down to here in mathematics. For instance, it's accepted, I would surmise, by the majority of mathematicians that it is objectively determined whether the number <laughs> 10 to the 100th plus three not plus one. Uh, 10 to the 100 plus one is often a favorite example, but actually it's of the form x to the fifth plus one, which is divisible by x plus one. And when you work it all out, uh, just some of the factors, it's actually divisible by uh, 100, by, um, uh, by 137. I know this because I, I looked into this question, but anyway, 10 to the 100 uh, to the uh, 10 or 10 to the 10 to the 10, Googleplex plus three. Googleplex, 10 to the 10 to the 100 uh, to the, uh, plus three is, is, is the prime number or not. It, it presumed by most mathematicians, even, even constructivists, 
uh, that that it, it, that that it is uh, that it is either uh, 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 that, it, that it's either prime or not. Even if it seems like we'll never know it, it's too big probably even for computers to determine. But in the case of fiction, the case is otherwise. Scholars may de uh, debate Shakespeare's identity, but the question of whether Hamlet's bre the breeches were say green lacks determinacy. Indeed, borders on the absurd, since no scrutiny of, Sh of Shakespeare's play could reveal their color. Here, the play is indeed the thing. By contrast, the manner in which reified objects are treated both in constructive and in structuralist axiomatic mathematics, category theory, for example, bears a closer resemblance to fiction. Constructive mathematicians acknowledge that the concepts and, and devices of mathematics are invented or constructed. This is another important issue in, in the philosophy of mathematics. Do we really discover mathematical truths, if you like, or do we invent them? Uh, at any rate, here the constructive mathematics, finite objects such as individual natural numbers are treated as if their finitistic properties were fully determinate. Potentially infinite objects such as a set of natural numbers, numerical functions, and individual real numbers are treated in a manner familiar to similar to fictional characters in that their properties are taken to be open to further determinations. The same can be said of structuralist mathematics. Just as Sherlock Holmes or Philip Marlowe, another famous uh, detective, uh, have been the protagonists of a number of sequels to the original works in which they made their debuts. <clears throat> Some structuralist math uh, uh, so in structural mathematics, there are a number of ways of spelling out the properties of say the real number system sequels, as it were, to its original conception. Models have been constructed in which every function on the real numbers is continuous. Although Brouwer thought that, that was objectively true of the continuum, or at least uh, his idea of the continuum. Like the practice of, fic practice of fiction, structuralist mathematics, like is, is, one might say is pluralistic. Whereas of course the platonic attitude, the platonistic attitude is really, it's, it's monistic, there really is only one truth. Now, finally, I want to make just briefly remark on why is mathematical beauty so little appreciated by non mathematicians, as, which is well known, a well known phenomenon. Mathematics uh, is notoriously unpopular with, or at best, misunderstood by the general public. Indeed, many people have a diversion to mathematics, more uh, math anxiety verging on fully fledged mathophobia has been identified by educators as a serious malady affecting not only high school students, but the broader public. The very idea that there could be beauty in mathematics strikes the man in the street as bizarre. At best, mathematicians are given grud grudging re recognition as priests practicing some obscure and unintelligible religion, which was, of course, one of Grodendieck's uh, later complaints, observations. The mathematician Paul Halmos, I'm sure many of you heard of, who was a uh, very uh, I mean, credible mathematician and also a very good expositor. And I don't know if texts are used as much as they were, but he's also quite a, he was actually quite a good popularizer of mathematics too. When he was asked by someone, when asked by someone what his profession was, reports that he was often tempted to reply, I'm in roofing and siding rather than try to spare the interlocutor the embarrassment of, of being confronted with an actual mathematician who don't know what to say. My own experience is similar. Well, I'm not really officially, I'm retired now anyway, but I, I left the math department for philosophy department 30 years ago. But anyway, my own experience has been similar. As what my profession is, I first admit blushingly. Well, I did, but I, as I say, I'm now retired. This is before I retired that I'm a university professor. If that fails to extinguish the exchange and I am further asked what subject I profess, I hesitate. If I say philosophy, I often receive a delighted response and an enthusiastic dilation on the meaning of life. On the other hand, if I overcome my inhibitions and confess that I'm a mathematician, let alone a logician, I'm usually met with embarrassed silence broken only by my interlocutor's disconsolate admission of, 
I was never very good at math. I believe that the unpopularity of mathematics stems largely from the fact that the beauty of mathematics resides almost exclusively in the realm of the intelligible. It is thus regarded as dry and difficult. In this regard, music, which abounds in sensible beauty, offers a striking contrast. Musical activity involves three overlapping, but essentially distinct classes of people, composers, performers, and listeners. Composers and performers respond to both the intelligible and sens sensible beauties of music, while the vast majority of listeners respond solely to its sensible beauties. In what you might call serious mathematics, on the other hand, these three categories are collapsed into one. <clears throat> Yet mathematics is not intrinsically more difficult than music, at least in terms of the acquisition of technique. Mathematicians and musicians alike strive to develop and perfect their techniques. The difference is that the performing musician struggles to perfect his or her art is, if successful, finally crowned with popular success uh, it matter whether it's popular music or, or, or class, classical music interest has declined, but in popular music too, I mean, people become skilled and they get popular success rather, maybe rather more quickly or anyway, but nevertheless, the point is the same. No matter how difficult it may be to play a Beethoven sonata, a Paganini caprice, or to lay down an intricate jazz imp improvisation, an untutored ear can enjoy listening to it and respond to the beauty of the piece. Despite lacking the slightest idea of how to play it, or due to the say case of popular singers, how to sing it. It's, it's the same thing in principle. By contrast, the esoteric beauty of most mathematical creations is appreciated only by those mathematicians who are able, like performers of music, to recreate the mathematical work. Of course, this, I have to admit, this is changing it's, 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 with the advent uh, of the computer. That is true. That has had a real impact on the way that some forms of mathematics actually get through to the public now. Mathematics would, I believe, become more popular if in teaching the subject at the elementary level, greater efforts were made to convey its beauty, albeit of a purely intelligible kind, to students. To set the ball rolling, one might present examples of beautiful mathematical theorems whose meaning is readily grasped. This, these could include the Pythagorean theorem, the theorem that there are exactly five regular polyhedra, Euler's polyhedron formula of V minus E plus F equals two, Lagrange's theorem that every even number is a sum of four squares, and the four color theorem. Well, that is a beautiful theorem, but nobody, there's, there's no very elegant proof of it, of course, so far. Everyone is capable of appreciating the beauty of truths like these. All could then join Keats in drinking Newton's health without further declaring, as did the poet, confusion to mathematics. Thank you very much. <laughs>